Glory to God. <clears throat> Good to see all of the visitors here. Amen. 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 And good to see everybody else here. And we certainly acknowledge that God is here. Amen. And uh, if he wasn't here, none of the rest of it would matter. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So we, we've been teaching from the subject. Which this will be part four. Uh, we've been teaching from the subject of understanding faith. And how it works. Understanding faith. And how it works. Praise God. Listen I, I, I want you to be praying with me. I want you to believe God with me for utterance. I want you to trust God. Love for you enough. That he would speak to you about you. That he would give you answers. That you've been seeking. That he would address things that matter to you today by his spirit within the course of this service. Amen. Amen. Will you believe God with, uh, for utterance with me? Amen. Okay, say, say this. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe you for an open door of utterance in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, if you, you maintain your faith with me throughout this service and some stuff will come forth that's going to bless you. I'm pregnant, man. I'm, I'm loaded. I'm, I'm loaded with this word, man. With the, I'm so excited about you. But, but, but a, lot of, a lot of what I'm able to release is going to have a lot to do. I, look, I prepared my heart. I released my faith. And, and as you do the same, we're going to have an awesome time. You're going to get some answers. Amen? Amen. So, so place a draw on, on God's spirit, on his anointing, on his love. So we've been talking about understanding faith. And how it works. And, 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 and we've, been, we've been sharing how. Uh, in this, in, how, how many of you know the Bible tells us in four different uh, places. The just shall live by faith. Yes. Now you know you are the just right. Yes. Your faith in the blood of Jesus has justified you. You have been justified by your faith in the blood. And you are God's righteousness. So as his righteousness you are commanded by God to live by faith. You and I, we are commanded to, to live and order our lives by faith. Amen? Now, now that's, that's a commandment, but, but it's also, uh, I believe, a prophetic statement that, that we're in the season of. Uh, a man of God, years ago, I heard make this statement that not only the just shall live by faith, a commandment is a prophetic statement, meaning there's coming a time, there's coming an hour. Right? Where things in the earth will be such that if the just do not live by faith, the just won't live. See, and I believe we're at that time. See, 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 what do I mean by live by faith? That means we live, we order, we regulate our lives according to what we're hearing and seeing from God. Not according to how things look or how we feel. We live in all our lives according to the truth revealed to us by the Spirit of God as opposed to what our natural minds can conceive and birth out of human reasoning. It's about walking and living according to the revelation we get from God as opposed to human reasoning. Are you understand what I'm saying? So, so now listen, listen, listen. We as believers, if we're not going to look to God to hear what he has to say about our lives, to listen to what he's revealing to our lives, and live according to that, then, then, then we're not living. We're not living the life he called us to. We're not living the life he intended for us. You know what we're doing? We're just marking time till we die. We're just marking time until the effects of the curse catch up with it and run its course and we die. But Jesus came that we have life. And have it more abundantly. Yeah. There's a level and a quality of life that is beyond what the human intellect can even conceive. That must be revealed to us by the Spirit of God. And as we receive what's revealed, accept it as the truth, and order our lives accordingly, we can experience a quality of life beyond what you can even ascertain with your senses. 
You can live beyond and above the present circumstances. Glory to God. Are, are you following what I'm saying? So this, this, this is the, the, the part four of that. And uh, we've had different subtopics that we've emphasized along the way. The importance of faith. Uh, releasing the force of faith. Giving God's word first place. So today my subtopic is your future is in your mouth. Your future is in your mouth. Now, now I don't think y'all got this scripture. Uh, of course, it don't matter now. We, we had, I think we had some uh, power shortages with the storm. So this is not being live streamed today. But turn with me to Psalm, uh, Psalm 31. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Psalm 31. And I want to read a verse to you in a couple different uh translations Psalm 31 uh, I want to I'm going to read verse uh, uh, I want to read verse 14 and 15 but I trusted in thee O Lord I said but I trusted in thee O Lord I said thou art my God see that's where it all begins you can't you can't walk by faith without first trusting in God you see to walk by faith means to live in obedience to what God says and I can't live in obedience to a God I can't trust so I got to first make the quality decision to trust in God that this word is God, that he is everything he says he is and that I am everything he says I am. Amen. But look at verse 15. He says, my times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from them that persecute me. My times are in thy hand. You hear that? Now, the New Living Translation says it this way. It says, my future is in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. My future is in your hands. So, so, so with, with everything that's going on uh, presently uh, in the earth, uh, in this nation, this country, with the economy, social injustice, with all the different issues and all the different movements, with all the various crises going on across the world that are having a direct effect on this nation. With all of that going on, uh, Satan is looking to use that data to invoke a fear. He's, he's looking to manipulate us in our thinking and our believing with, 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 that, with those facts, right? To get us worried and in fear over our future. Well, what's my future going to look like? What, how, how am I going to be able to do this? They're talking about a, another, they're talking about the recession, the value, the dollar losing its value. They're talking about inflation. Talking, with all of this going on, Right. There is a temptation to ask the wrong questions. There is a temptation to take evil thoughts by saying, how am I going to make it? How am I going to pay for my gas? How am I going to take care of this? How am I going to be able to do this? When we ask these questions. How am I? Listen to that. How am I going to be able to do that? Just by that question, you're taking ownership of the responsibility of it. And you are not responsible to care for you. Amen. If you have received Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, Jesus is responsible to take care of you. And he cares for you through the commandments he gives you. Every commandment in this book is an expression of God's love for us. It is him caring for us. It is through these that he keeps us. Amen? Amen. So, so now the book says my future is in your hands. So we don't have to worry about the future. But now listen, listen, listen. Let me read that from the, from the, from the, the Passion Translation. Now listen to this. It says my life, my every moment, my destiny, it's all in your hands. My life, my every moment, my destiny, it's all in your hands. Now, what that means, what that simply means is God, in loving and caring for us, has predestined, right, a quality of life for us. He's predestined or predetermined uh, our calling, uh, our purpose. So to say, when he says, when we say it's in his hands... We're acknowledging that everything about our life 
he has, he has predetermined and predestined in a particular order and fashion. Amen. And it's a good order. It's a good fashion. Yeah. Are you understand what I'm saying? There are things that God has purposed for us in life. There are things God has purposed for us to have and experience in life. There is a certain quality and level of life that God has purposed for us and predestined for us to experience. However, it's not going to automatically come to pass just because he has purposed it for us. Are you understand what I'm saying? So, so, so I am submitting to you. Even so, when we say our life, our future, our destiny is in God's hands, we are acknowledged that He has purposed a future, a destiny, a rich quality of life for us. But, but, but whether or not it becomes a reality, see, that's something else. That's going to take us cooperating with God. God has His part to play in His will being done in our lives, and we have our part to play in His will being done in our lives. He, 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 he has what he has purposed for us and we have to cooperate with him in order to walk in and experience that purpose. Are you understand what I'm saying? So, so, so I'm saying to you, even though he has a, a life he's purposed for us, uh, your future is really in your mouth. Because, because, because what God has purposed for us can be altered and become something altogether different if the words of our mouth don't line up with what he is saying in that book. See, see, part of my objective here with this message is to help us understand why saying the right thing matters. Saying about you what God has already said about you matters. See, it's true because God said it. He said it, and then man heard it, and wrote it, scripted it. Are you understand? So everything that's scripted was first spoken. And so it's true because he said it. But now if what he said is going to be seen in your life, you're going to have to say it too. The reality is what we are seeing today in our lives, what we're seeing, and we'll make it personal, what I am seeing in my life today, what I'm seeing today was in my mouth yesterday. What you are seeing today was in your mouth yesterday. Now, I'm not speaking literally today and yesterday, but, but the things that seem to continuously be going on in your life, to be continuously manifesting in your life, those things that are seen in this season, in this hour, are the result of things you have spoken in previous hours. See, it, see, see even in those instances where the enemy may come to attack, to afflict us with evil, Right? Yeah, he showed up and brought a package. But in order for it to remain and become uh, uh, and sustain, we got to sign for it. And we've been signing for some stuff thinking, thinking that, that, that it was at the right address and it wasn't. Are y'all following what I'm saying? <sighs> what, what we are seeing Today is a result of what we've been saying in our yesterdays. So now, if we keep saying what we've always been saying, we're going to keep seeing what we're currently seeing. So now, if you want your future to be what God purposed, get your now lined up with what he's saying. By begin to say about your life, about your situation, what God has already said about your life and situation in his word and believe it's coming to pass and go about your business expecting it to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you will do that in your now, 
What you're saying out of your mouth now will become seen in your future. Are y'all following what I'm saying? But the flip side is it works whether we're talking about the good or the negative. That, that, that's, that's, see, see why, why, why does this work? Because it's how you and I were created. We, we, the Bible tells in Genesis uh, 1 that God created us in his image and in his likeness. In other words, he, he, he looked to himself in terms of creating us. And, not, and, and he made us to act like him. Made in his image and his likeness, right? Our likeness to God is our ability to choose and speak words. Now, in, in Genesis 2 and 9, it talks about when he breathed the breath of life into them, they became a living soul. And, and we've talked about this before, that the Jewish Hamas says that, that they became a living, speaking spirit, just like God. So you and I, because we've been made in the image and the likeness of God, and, and because he has breathed the, 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 his, his being into us, we have become as he is. Even on this side of the cross, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. We are living, speaking spirits, having creative power and ability in our tongue. Proverbs 18 and 21 talks about that. Right? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that, what? Love it, meaning you don't exercise no restraint over it. You will eat the fruit that your tongue creates. So, so the fruit that's in our life is a creation of our tongue. Words spoken by our tongue. Good, bad, or indifferent. Right? So, so, so if we can understand that what I have currently going on on a continuous basis is a result of what I've been continually saying, I can change my future and ensure it'll be what God purposed by lining my mouth up with what he said. Yes, thank you, Lord. Yes. Glory to God. So you can change every current, every present evil condition going on in your life right now. You can change it. With, 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 with your confession. Amen. Glory to God. Are you following what I'm saying? You can change it. With, listen, listen, listen. I don't care what it is. If you can find in God's word what he said about it. And begin to spend time with what he said. Till you have a revelation of it. Then you can change whatever it is that's going on in your life. Whatever problems, whatever circumstances you got going on in your life, uh, financial issues, marital issues, family issues, whatever the case, all you got to do is find out what God said about it in his word. Find out what your covenant right is concerning it. Find out your covenant responsibilities concerning it. And bring your beliefs, your convictions, bring your speech, your thinking into alignment with it. Begin saying it. Confessing it as a present tense reality over your life. Believing in your heart that what you are saying will come to pass. Because that, that, that's, that's who you are. That's, that's the being you were created to be that you are. He, Jesus talked about that. We've been looking at that. Mark 11 and 22 and 23 and 24. He's responding to Peter's. Peter noticing that the tree dried up from the root. The tree that Jesus cursed. Jesus' response is, have faith in God. Yeah. We understand that the Greek says, have the God kind of faith, or the faith of God. Have meaning exercise, meaning apply, meaning put to work. So Jesus is, is saying to us that we are to have or exercise the very faith God dealt to us by saying what we say, believing in our heart that what we say shall come to pass, and as a result, we'll have what we say. Yeah. 
God has dealt to us the measure of faith, according to Romans 12 and 3. He has dealt to every born-again man the measure of faith. So don't worry about, well, my faith ain't big as yours. My faith. No, no, no. Every believer starts off with equal footing with God. It don't matter your skin color, black, white, tall, green, yellow, whatever. It don't matter your political party affiliation. It don't matter who you voted for. No. It, we all start off with equal footing with God. We were born again by the same spirit of God. We have, the very spirit of God is resident on the inside of each and every one of us. We all have the word of God. We have the name of Jesus. Right? We have the blood of Jesus. We all have the ability to tithe and honor God with what we have and who we are. Every, and we all were dealt the same measure of faith. Hallelujah. So nobody gets, no, we all start off on equal footing. So the, the big time evangelists don't have nothing on us. We all got dealt the same measure of faith. Now, now the question is, what are we doing with the measure we were dealt with? What are we doing with the measure we were dealt with? See, it's like a muscle. If you don't exercise it, there's a thing called atrophy that sets in and it weakens and diminishes. Faith is like that. You got to use it or you, you, you won't lose it, but it won't, it, it, you, the, 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 the force of it will not be what God intended it to be. But by using your faith, exercising your faith, believing in your heart and saying about your life with your mouth what God is says, expecting it to come to pass, backing that up with corresponding action, that releases your faith. That exercises your faith. And with the release or the exercising of your faith, it grows and develops. As you're positioning yourself to hear the preached word of God, you hear an anointed utterance spoken by the Spirit of God, and it's upon hearing that utterance that faith grows, faith develops. In Hebrews chapter 12, it tells us in verse 2 that we are to continually run with steadfast, persistent patience. Amplified translate. The race that God has set before us or called us to while looking, looking, looking unto Jesus, away from all that distracts, but looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That word finisher is developer. Are you understand what I'm saying? So now, we're to run the race God called us to. We're to live the life he called us to. We're to, we're, we're to live as he speaks guides and leads us to the end with the end purpose being uh, to the, 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 the end result being that his purpose is fulfilled in our life and we run that race we, we live that life we render that service looking unto Jesus now the Bible says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us Jesus is the word made flesh. So if I run my race looking unto Jesus, I run my race looking to the word. Yes. Leaning in, looking to, depending on, giving attention and consideration to the word of God, to the promises of God. To what God is saying to me in this moment about this situation. I give my attention and consideration to what he's saying, to what he's promised. To the instructions, to the correction. I'm responding in faith to that as I hear as I see from God, I'm responding in faith and making the necessary adjustment in my heart, in my mind, in my speech, in my conduct. I'm constantly lining up, getting in sync with the Lord so I can take that next step of faith. Amen. Are you understand what I'm saying? And that causes my faith to develop, to strengthen, to become greater. In other words, when I release faith, through the words I speak and the actions I take, the measure of the force of that faith is greater. It's stronger. And I'm able to impact more with it. Are y'all understand what I'm saying? 
I, I mean, I mean, now, now I'm not asking for a show of hands. I'm not trying to be funny, but I'm just trying to help us get it with a natural illustration. Now, I mean, how many, don't raise your hands, just teaching purposes only. How, how many of y'all can, can, can do a pull-up? I, I mean, I don't, you ain't got to raise your hand. I mean, I know there's some in here that can. I mean, one pull-up. Right? Now, now, now. Let, now listen to me. Those that can do a pull-up and those who cannot do a pull-up, those who can do a pull-up don't have any additional muscles than those who can't do a pull-up. It's just that their muscles are developed enough to where they can sufficiently pull their body weight. But they don't have any additional muscles. Are oh, you understand what I'm saying? We were all dealt or fashioned or created by God with the same measure or amount or number of muscles. It's what you do with them. By exercising, they grow stronger and you develop and, and, and your muscles can create, can exert a greater force. Are oh, you understand what I'm saying? Y'all still tripping off the pull up. <laughs> See, just like for some, that pull-up might, might just be just beyond the current development of our muscles. There may be some things God is trying to get into your hands, things he's purposed for you, things he's promised to you, that you desire. You, gotta, you, you see that it's, that it's available, but they might be just beyond your current development of faith to sufficiently take it. But if you go to that gym and practice those pull-ups... Even if you can't do a pull-up, step up on something and hold yourself there and let yourself down slow. Because see, you're putting pressure on the muscles used for your pull-up, your biceps, your, 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 your lats and all of that that goes into the pull-up. You're, you're, you're putting, you're, you're putting those, you're exercising those muscles. You're putting a demand on it. When you make a confession of what God promised, when you make, when you believe you receive and you confess that you have it, you're placing a demand on your faith. You're called, you're, you're, you're placing a demand on your faith. Ugh. You're engaging your faith. It's becoming active. It, and, and, and with the activity of your faith, it's developing. And if you'll stay with it, you'll see the day when you can go in there and do them pull-ups and knock out 10 of them. If you'll stay with it, you'll see the day where your faith is developed enough to, uh, to, to rearrange conditions in your lives and make it what God intended. Are y'all following what I'm saying? <clears throat> Matthew, tw Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Now, I'm going to, the operative verse I want to look at is verse 30. So I'm going to start in, in part B of verse 34 after the question mark, Matthew 12 and 34. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. And I say unto you that every man... Excuse me, I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Thou shalt be justified by thy words, or you shall be condemned by your words. So whether you're justified or condemned is not determined by God or Satan. But by our words. Now we can look at the word justified. And, and, and we, we know enough Bible to see. That the word justified is synonymous with being blessed. Right? Because if you're justified by faith. You are blessed. The blessing has come on you. Right? We can see that the word uh, condemned. Is synonymous with being cursed. If you're condemned you're cursed. Right? So, so here's. So. 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 So by my words, okay, so hold that, put a pin there, go to, go to, Psalm, go to Isaiah 65, verse 16, in the Amplified Translation, and it says that 
if you will bless yourself in the land, you will do so by saying. Look at it, look at it, look at it, look at it, look at it. Isaiah, Isaiah 65. Y'all know it's over there, right? Isaiah 65, look at verse, verse number 16 in the Amplified Trans. Well, since we're going to look at it, look at it in the, look, look at, look at it in the King James. That he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. All right, that's all I want right now. Go to the Amplified. So it shall be that he who invokes a blessing on himself in the land shall do so by saying. So, so, so now go back, go back to Matthew 12. By my words, I'm justified or I am blessed. By my words, I'm condemned or I am cursed. And I see in Isaiah 65 that based on what I'm saying, I'm, I'm, if, if, I, if I'm going to bless myself, I do it. If I'm going to invoke a blessing, I do it by saying. So, so, so whether I'm justified is a result of what I say, whether I'm condemned is a result of what I say, right? Why? Because based on what I'm saying, I'm either invoking a blessing or I'm invoking a curse. If I am invoking a blessing, then the goodness of God will be seen in my life. But if I'm invoking a curse, then the calamity and sorrow of God will be seen in my life. So I am the one who determines what's going to be seen in my life by what I choose to be saying with my mouth. So, 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 so if I will be justified by my words, that's future tense. We're talking my future. So my future is a result of what I'm saying with my mouth. Your future is in your mouth. Before it's manifested in your life, it's, 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 it's spoken out your mouth. So I invoke a blessing by saying about my life what God has already said in his word, expecting it to come to pass. Or I invoke a curse and causing calamity and sorrow to be seen by saying about my life what I presently see. See, I can say about my life and, and, and begin to act according. See, 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 okay. See, see, if I study all of what the financial experts say uh, about our current times based on current present conditions and circumstances, then I will be saying with my mouth about my life something contrary than what God says. God said what he said and what he said is true. But because I'm saying something different, I'm going to have something different in my life. I'm going to have what I say in my life. I'm not going to have what God said in my life if what I'm saying is something different. Even though God has purposed a good life for me, I can alter what he purposed by saying what I'm currently seeing instead of what he promised. You ain't hear me. God has purposed, predetermined, and predestined a good life for all of us. But if what I am saying about my life is contrary to what he is saying about my life, my words will alter what he has purposed. And I'm going to have what I'm saying about me as opposed to what he said. Are you following what I'm saying? Let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. Let's contrast something. Go to Psalm 90. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Go to Psalm 90. We're going to look at Psalm 90. We're going to look at Psalm 91. Now, Psalm 90 and Psalm 91 are both credited uh, to Moses. Moses wrote both of these songs. And, and that's important to, to note that. Now, 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 we're going to see how with our words that we're speaking out of our mouth, we can alter what God has purposed for our lives. Are you understand what I'm saying? 
And see, now, 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 once you get this, once you see this, right, God, God is going to hold us accountable to live on the level of this revelation. You understand what I'm saying? Woo, Jesus. See, once you prove for yourself the word of God is real, true, and faithful, you're required now to live in the strength of that. You're now required to live and conduct your life in the strength of what you have just proven to be his will for you. Are you understand what I'm saying? And why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? All right, now, now, now let, let, me, let me show you. Thank you, Lord. All right, you're in Psalm 90. You hear this at a funeral a, a lot of times. Look at verse 10. For the days of our years are three score years and ten. That's 70. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, that's 80. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So a lot of times at funeral, you know, if somebody hit 70, get close to 70, a little over 70, you know, we're celebrating them. Praise God, they, you know, they got what God promised. Yeah. But that's a, this, this is not what God promised. God, God, God never promised us 70 or 80 years. See, Psalm, look, Psalm 90, this, what we hear, what we see written by Moses, this is the, the 70 or 80 years is, is, is what has been afforded to the children of Israel who were murmuring and complaining as a result of Moses interceding for them. Go, hold your place right here. Go to Numbers chapter uh, 14. God never intended you to have uh, 7 to 80 years. Well, well, since you're going so far to Genesis, just go, let's just knock this in the, in the head real quick. Go on to Genesis chapter 6. We will come back to the Numbers, numbers uh, 14. But go to Genesis chapter 6. Look at verse number three. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. 120 years. That's God's promise. That's God's original intent. Well, his original intent was we live forever. But, you know, Adam's sin messed that up. So. Where are you now? I just had numbers. Where did it go? So um, this, this, this 70 or 80 business is, 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 is not what God originally intended. It is the result of Moses' intercession because God himself was going to kill them all. He's going to kill them then. Numbers 14, are you there? Look at verse 2. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. The whole congregation said unto them, Would God that he ha we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness. In other words, they're murmuring and complaining, blaming God for bringing them to the place where they can go into the promised land. But they see that the giants are there, and they see there's some opposition, some adversity. There's some challenges, right? And so, so they're blaming God, and they're saying, man, we just should have, you, you shouldn't even brought us out here, God. You should have just left us alone in Egypt, let us die there, or let us die in the wilderness on the way here. That, they're murmuring and complaining. Are you following what I'm saying? All right. <clears throat> so um, verse 3 says, Therefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And see, that's what the flesh always want to do. When, when Satan puts enough pressure on us, the flesh is looking for relief. It's looking for comfort. So it goes back to what's familiar. It go back to what, when you're trying to do them pull-ups. It's going to get uncomfortable. You go like, man, forget this. When you're pressing in to your healing, to your divine health, it's going to get a little uncomfortable. When you're pressing in to the, to the liberal abundant supply of God for your life, a debt-free life of abundance, it's going to get a little uncomfortable. Right? But see, if you listen to human reasoning and you're going to conclude that that is so uncomfortable, you can't deal with it. You're going to be looking for relief by going back to the familiar. But now look. 
So now, now if you drop down to uh, verse number 9, Joshua uh, and Caleb, they, they, they were of a different uh, mindset, a different belief, right? And so verse number 9, they say, Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. For, so in other words, to murmur and complain about God is, is, is rebellion. Murmuring and complaining is a form of rebellion. Murmuring and complaining is a form of rebellion. Well, I don't believe it. Take all that. That's rebellion. I don't want to do that. I want to do that. That's rebellion. Going, uh, children, going against the authority of your parents. They are assigned by God with their responsibility to care for you and watch for you. They have authority that, that you are to honor. And when you murmur and complain, even if you do what they say, but you're doing murmuring and complaining, you're a rebellion. Even if you do what they say, but you do it with the wrong attitude, you don't get no blessing for doing it. Uh-huh. If, if God has given you and set godly authority over your life and you murmur complain against that counsel, against that word, you rebellion. <laughs> Lord, okay, yeah, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it, praise God. I, and y'all know I love you. That's why I'm saying it. See, I don't just do stuff to be doing it. I don't just have services to be having services. I don't just be having training sessions to be having training sessions. I don't do anything just to be doing it. If I do it, if I schedule it, I'm doing what I believe God would have me to do. So if God is having me to do it, who do you think he's thinking about when he tells me to do it? He's thinking about you. But now if when it come time to me, well, I'm tired. I don't feel like going, man, I worked all day. That's murmuring and complaining. You are rebelling against God at the very thing that's designed to set you free. I ain't mad at nobody. I love you. See, but I'm just saying. See, see, when we when when, when we wonder why our life ain't getting no better, there's a reason for it. All right. So so he identifies murmur and complaint. He equates that with rebellion, right? All right. So so now let's let's come on down. Now as a result of of all this rebellion. Look, look what God's take is on it. Uh, look, look at verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? How long will it be that they, be how long it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I've shown among them? Listen, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. I will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. In other words, Moses, God's like, man, I'm tired of this. I'm gonna kill all. I'm gonna kill them all off, Moses, and raise up another people greater than they are. This God talking. And then Moses began to intercede. He said unto the Lord in verse thirteen, He said the Egyptians were here. They say you could bring them out, but you couldn't take them in. So, so he he appealed to God, interceding on behalf of the children of Israel, right? Okay, now the Lord in response to Moses' intercession in verse 20, the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, right? But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swore unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it, except my servant Caleb, 
because he had another spirit with him and have followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went and his seed shall possess it. In other words, God is responding to Moses. He says, okay, I'm a, Moses, I ain't going to kill him like I said because you were interceding for him. He said, however, they're not going into the land. They're not going to, listen, they're not going to enter into the land that I promised them. Now, the promised land, the land of Canaan, the Bible says it flows with the milk of honey, milk, milk and honey. The, the, see, the, 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 the beauty, the value of Canaan land was its richness and the fertility of it. You're talking about an agrarian society that that allows for a rich, prosperous, abundant life. God desired that his people would have a rich, fulfilling, blessed and prosperous life. So he promised them a land that would afford that. You can see that over in Genesis chapter 17. He's talking to uh, Abram and he says, I'm, I've changed your name. I made a covenant with you. He says, listen, I'm going to be a God to you and to your seed in their generation. Right. And I'm going to give you this land of Canaan. Right. He promised them Canaan. You follow me? Now, Canaan belongs to Abraham and his seed. In their generation, every one of us, because we belong to Christ, we are Abraham's seed in our present generation. You can read about that in Galatians chapter 3. Right? We are Abraham's seed in our generation. So as the seed of Abraham, part of your inheritance is the land of Canaan. However, our Canaan land, as spiritual heirs, is not a geographical location. Our Canaan land is the kingdom of God wherein have been given us exceeding great and precious promises, right? Second Peter chapter one, verses three and four, right? According to his divine power, he hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, right? That through the knowledge of these, these exceeding great and precious promises, we may escape the corruption that's in this world through lust. And we are able to partake of God's divine nature. So every promise God has made you as, a, as his child, as a seed of Abraham, the fulfillment of that promise causes his goodness to manifest in your life. Every promise is designed to enhance, to improve the quality of your life. So your promised land is not a geographical location. Your promised land is the kingdom of God and all the exceeding great and precious promises God has given you. Are you following what I'm saying? So he's saying because of your murmuring, your complaining, your unbelief. They're not going to enter what the land I promised. They're not going to have the life that I promised them. Are you seeing what I'm saying? All right. We still in numbers 14. Now drop on down here in verse 28. Well, look at verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurs of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. In other words, as true, God is saying, As truly as I live and I'm God, it's going to be for you as you have spoken it into my ears. God, okay, you got that? Amen. All right, now let's roll on over here to verse. Let, well, uh, okay, let, let's go and read 29. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that would number to you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swore to make you dwell therein, except Caleb the son of Jephani and Joshua the son of Nun. Well, why did they get to go in the land? Because they didn't murmur and complain. They believed what God said. They said what God said. And they were willing to act on what God said. So they, 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 they get to have what God said. They, did, they said about themselves what God said. They didn't murmur and complain and say something. They didn't speak according to their circumstances. All right. Now, he says, but your little ones, which you should have, which, which you should be, 
But your little ones, which you said should be a prey, then will I bring in and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your hordes until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Okay, so for 40 years, they're going to wander in the wilderness. Now we're talking about everybody 20 and up are going are gonna, to are gonna die in the wilderness. Over the next 40 years. And this is where Moses is uh, talking to God about three score and ten and, and four score. If by reason the 70 or 80 was, was what was the result of Moses' interceding on behalf of the children of Israel. God's original intent for mankind was 120. When they murmured and complained, God was going to kill them off. But Moses stepped in and interceded so they got, they got 70 or 80. So, so 70 or 80, I mean, thank God for 70 or 80. But 70 or 80 ain't what God desires. It ain't the limit. It ain't the cap. His intent. His, his intent, again, remember, was that, that we live eternally forever. But because of sin being in the world, it capped off at 120. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? Now look at verse 34. And the number of the days in which you shall search the land, even 40 years, each day for a year, shall you bear, shall, shall, shall bear your iniquities, even 40 years. Listen, and you shall know my breach of promise. You will know my breach of promise. Now, in one of my study Bibles, the cross references says, you have altered my purpose. So our words of fear of doubt, of murmuring and complaining. We think we just keeping it real and telling it like it is. Because, because we have circumstantial evidence to support it when we speak that. Because of the authority we have in the earth, because of the created beings we are with living, with, with creative power and ability in our tongue, our words of fear and doubt, even though they're factual because they're contrary to God's word, they're full of fear and doubt, they override what God said and alter what he purposed in our lives. In other words, we are constantly altering the future God intended by speaking in line with the circumstances instead of the covenant. Now, if our words, if the power of our words are such that we can alter what God purposed, how much more can our words enforce what God purposed when our words line up with his? God didn't intend or purpose high blood pressure, sugar, diabetes, no sickness, disease, illness, no weak mind, blind eye. He ain't purpose none of that. And if we will line our words up with his, how much more can, will our words enforce the, 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 the future and the reality he purposed for us? Now, go back to Psalm 90. So, so we see this, these, this, this, this 7 and 80, Right? Moses was innocent. Okay. Now, keep in mind, what he's writing in 90, he ain't stop and start over in 91. The translator just put 91 in there to help us categorize stuff and find stuff. So what he's writing in Psalm 91, he was writing in Psalm 90. So in Psalm 90, he pointed out the, 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 the problem with saying the wrong thing, how we alter what God purposed. But now, in Psalm 91, he says this. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I submit to you that the secret place is a supernatural covering of protection that's the result of agreeing with God. He says you will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, the very presence of God will be your abode, your lodging place. He goes on to say, I will say of the Lord. Yeah. See that? Yeah. I will say of the Lord. So we got, now listen, listen. He is my refuge, 
my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. I'm saying of the Lord, he shall surely deliver thee from the snare of the fowl and the north and pestilence. I'm saying of the Lord, he will cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. I'm saying of the Lord, thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the air by the, the flies by day, nor the pestilence of walking in darkness, nor the destruction of the wasted in noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Now, that's, that's what we're to be saying about our God and our Father. We are to, first of all, agree with him about who he says he is and then say that about him. That's worshiping him. That's honoring him. That's loving him. When we agree with him about who he is and say that about him. Now, now the children of Israel were murmuring and complaining. They were saying evil things about God. He don't care about us. He's going to leave us out here to die. He ain't studying me. No. Let your words line up with God, with the covenant. All right, now listen. So verses 2 through verses 8, that's what we're to say. Now if you notice when you read verse 9, there's a little shift here. Listen, because thou has made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. See, now that's Jesus speaking. See, when we say about God who he says he is and say about our life who he says we are, Jesus has something to say. Glory to God. Look. He says, because Jesus saying, because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands lest you dash your feet against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon. You shall trample under feet. Now that's Jesus talking. Now verses 14 through 16. That's God talking. <laughs> God is saying now, because he has set his love upon me. <laughs> See, when you are saying about God and talking about his goodness, that's setting your love upon him. That's worshiping him. That's honoring him. He's saying, because you set your love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I'll answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him. And show him my salvation. Verse 16. Psalm 91, 16. Contrast that with Psalm 90 and 10. It's a big difference between 70 and 80 years. And being satisfied with long life. And the only difference is in what you're saying. That's the only difference. It's in what you're saying. Your future is in your mouth. You can change. You can change your future. By changing your present confession. Line up with God. Put his word in your mouth. Set your affection on him, your love on him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Man, you can come over and see the offering.